Hello, my name is Gil Penalosa and this is Cities for Everyone, the webinar. Every other Tuesday, I invite fascinating people from around the world to share experiences and knowledge that will help us create affordable, equitable, and sustainable cities. I was born in Bogota, Colombia, where as commissioner, I led the design and construction of over 200 parks and took a small program called Ciclovia, open streets, and increased it to over 120 kilometers, 75 miles of car-free streets every Sunday and holiday with more than a million people walk, bike, run, shop, enjoying the presence of each other. 17 years ago, I created 880 Cities, a nonprofit organization based in Toronto, Canada, where I live. Last year, I ran for mayor and came second with 100,000 votes. My aim was to change the conversation in creating a Toronto for everyone. I've been fortunate to have worked in over 350 cities in all continents, sharing and learning. Based on all experiences, I developed master classes and keynotes customized to each city. But Cities for Everyone, the webinar, is a way of giving back. It's always free and hopefully always interesting. Please invite others to join us every other Tuesday, anyone who cares about cities and people, equity and sustainability, about all living older, healthier and happier. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are. My name is Gil Penalosa, and I'm the founder of 880 Cities and also Cities for Everyone, as well as this webinar. And today we have hundreds of people from over 30 different countries around the world. And we have a fascinating guest. We have Mike Lydon, who's going to talk about tactical urbanism, transform your city today. And tactical urbanism it's a fascinating tool to help move things from talking to doing, to show everyone, including the cave people, the citizens against virtually everything, that you can actually make that change and it's not going to be the end of the world. It's a way to do it fast and to do it uh, well done so that both decision makers and citizens uh, can see what the change is about, make adjustments, improve, and then make it permanent. Mike Lydon, who has experience across the US as well as in many other, many countries, is our guest. Mike, thank you very much for having accepted the invitation. And please tell us about what tactical urbanism is, how it can be used, and how is it helpful for both city leaders as well as for citizens. Great. Thank you, Gil. And hello to all of you from around the world. This is incredible. You're, you're following and uh, the people who are connected to you, Gil, this is a wonderful example of that uh, for sure. So can you see my second slide? Just confirming? Yes. It's good. Okay. Wonderful. So I'm an urban planner. Um, I've been doing this for almost 20 years. Um, I live in Brooklyn, New York, but I'm from a very small town in rural coastal Maine, which is called Damrascada, Maine. You can see it there on, on the right. Um, I'm really passionate about streets and public spaces. I got into urban planning to try to change the world, like a lot of young planners, and really got somewhat disillusioned with the, the pace of change and the way we were engaging the public in thinking about transforming our, our, our communities. And so really it was, Gil, you, know, you being an inspiration and seeing a street film from Clarence Eckerson in 2007, where I got exposed to this idea of the cyclovia, and like hundreds and thousands of cities around the world, we were able to do that in Miami as well, which is where I was living, working and advocating at the time. You can see there the image from the very first uh, Ciclovia or open streets as we call it in the US um, in downtown Miami. And to me, that was just such a transformative moment to be a young planner, to have helped bring this to fruition with the city and to actually see people in the street enjoying it in a completely new way. And that's really one of the big inspirations for street plans, which, you know, we're now grown to a much larger team. We're in Miami, Atlanta, New York, and many other markets around the United States. And we work 
internationally. And one of the big things that we do is, yes, planning projects, thinking about long-term future possibilities, but also designing and then implementing the, uh, the, the sort of best and quickest versions of those big ideas to make that change happen a lot faster and to test ideas. And really uh, at this point, you know, more than almost two decades later, the imperative to make these changes, I think is, is bigger and more important than ever in terms of how we're trying to decarbonize while at the same time humanize our communities. This is you know part of my community here in New York City. This is Broadway um, in the heart of Soho. We were involved with a project there to transform that street, transform that district to be much more people friendly. And you know, as in on Broadway and New York City and cities around the world, people really don't like the idea of change. And so while this is a great pretty picture, um, we really have to think about process and how we deliver change over time. And those pretty pictures only, can only take you so far uh, within the larger planning and infrastructure delivery process. You know, it really is about those large scale, inflexible and very expensive projects. Of course, this would be, this whole project would be quite in, uh, expensive in the end. Um, and, you know, too often the process is built on the input of too, too few right? Not giving a wider majority of people the experience of that change. And so I love this quote from Nicholas uh, Bagley, he's a professor at the University of Michigan, who said that liberal governance has developed a puzzling preference for legitimating government action through process rather than outcomes. And so we like to say we're not doing enough of the doing. And this was actually the case while we were developing this plan for Soho. This was during the pandemic. We were not able to do as many things as we would like to do in person, and in the streets. And so a lot of this planning was done online. I think we saw a real limitation with that. Um, and we really saw that that sort of approach with planning and thinking only about strategy leaves out the tactics and the tactics are what we need in our city. So as we emerged from the pandemic here in New York City, we were able to get out into the streets and do what I think we do best, which was to help give people that real experience. And so this is Prince Street, one block. We were trying to you know propose to pedestrianize this as part of the plan. And then we showed people what that could look like on four weekends in the month of October, 2021. And by doing this, we were able to expose the sheer number of people who could use that street when you go from this to that. And then we're able to interview and collect data from real world people, real world users, and understand the shortcomings, the possibilities, and the learnings from doing this project. Uh, but we saw that just in three hours time, we had more than 8,000 people walking and using the street, which is normally used by 4,500 vehicles per day. And so that's a really, really strong, I think, outcome and argument that this could be a much more um, welcoming environment. So it was quieter, you know, there's more people, people could hang out. It was sort of this phenomenal moment where we could like mirror back to a lot of the people who were negative about those proposed changes that when we actually talked to real people on the real street, we found that you know half of them were from New York City, half then again were from the actual neighborhood, and that the vast majority of people, eighty nine percent, wanted to see that sort of short term transformation happen, um, you know, more long term. Amongst the Soho residents, uh, of which we heard from very you know a vocal minority who didn't want to see this change happen, seventy nine percent wanted to see that change happen long term, and so. We couldn't get at those real numbers, that understanding of support or the interest in that kind of change to the streets without taking the ideas to the street. And that's what we call tactical urbanism, which is an approach to community building that uses short-term, low-cost and scalable projects that are intended from the very beginning to catalyze long-term change. And so that's what makes this specific as a, as a methodology is that we're always thinking to the mid and long-term, but we're starting today. So this idea is to get away from just the focus of the project delivery process for long-term infrastructure projects, which take forever and oftentimes never actually are achieved, or if they are achieved, the outcomes uh, you know, are 20 years behind the times. And so we really think that you have to think about it more iteratively, that you have to test before you invest. Peel back those long-term capital projects and start with something that can happen in one day as you can see here on the left with the cones, to something that can be measured and evaluated over months or years as a pilot project. And then you can try to figure out, okay, we've had this success, we've learned a lot, but we still don't have you know, the millions and millions of dollars to yet transform a street. In fact, you may never have the money to transform that street in your lifetime. So how can we use 
what we call interim design, which is still flexible, still lower cost, but more durable and longer lasting than a demonstration or a pilot. And so this is actually the, the sort of the guts of the methodology that we use um, and how we arrive at long-term investments. And I won't go through this chart. You can certainly look at the presentation later, but from you know project leaders to the materials you can use, to the public involvement uh, techniques, to the, how flexible or not, how expensive these projects are. Every one of these three categories is a little bit different and there's a methodology for each. There's lots of benefits to work this way. I think you know primarily it is that experiential engagement that you're showing, not telling, and you're able to reach everyday citizens on the street where they are. Um, we find that this approach can build political will and deliver public benefits faster. And as anything we should be doing as planners, it's people-driven and people-centered. And by people-driven, we work with communities, you know, alongside communities and, and residents and advocates to actually install the infrastructure. So that street I told you about and showed you at the beginning in Miami, it's Flagler Street downtown. It, there's a rendering in the middle and then there's a ribbon cutting recently on transforming that street into one that's curbless and can be used for events such as open streets with much more frequency. So short-term action can absolutely lead to long-term change. A little bit more academically here, you know, we've seen this methodology and our excitement for it, you know, and our tools and methods have, have evolved as practitioners around the globe. You know, when I got really excited about this idea that we coined tactical urbanism, it really was being inspired by people who are doing bottom up, exciting short term projects, you know, by themselves, oftentimes without permission, as you see there on the left. And so we documented a lot of those. And then we saw, you know, moving on that cities start to adapt these, these practices and learn how to do it in house with community groups. And then we started to see the, the sophistication and the duration of these projects you know, increase the introduction of asphalt art, which is now a global practice, um, to then the, the COVID pandemic, which was, you know, this horrible, horrible, you know, uh, event that happened around the, the, the year, sorry, around the globe for years. And what was the way that we could respond to the demands of the pandemic between our buildings? It was tactical urbanism, right? So there's a real resilience there. So we work, you know, with communities of all different sizes from, you know, 1,000 people to 10 million people, as Gil mentioned. These projects get adapted and look a little bit different and function a little bit differently in rural to suburban to urban environments. Um, we think it's actually easier and faster. It can be more powerful to work in smaller uh, communities because the, the, the process to get change to happen and the relative impact of one or two projects in a smaller place can be you know, exponentially greater than in a city like, like New York City. So again, you don't, don't feel like no matter where you are, you can't do, work this way. And then with regions, states, even whole countries like New Zealand, we've advised and supported on tactical urbanism programs and policies to really scale up this work at a large, large scale. Um, so that's also possible as, as well. Um, so I'm going to go through 10 really you know, quickly, really 10 common applications. And then I'm going to go through just two case studies in a little bit more uh, detail to give you a sense of um, both you know, failures and, and successes with the application of the methodology. So what I was saying earlier with sort of guerrilla and, and you know, bottom-up activism, you know, that was something that got me intrigued with this, this, this methodology. And when, as we dug into this, my partner Tony and I and started writing our book, we started to realize that this history doesn't just go back to 2001 or, you know, 1990 or 1970, like you see there on the left with the first guerrilla um, bike lanes in Montreal, which is now one of the most bike-friendly cities in North America. But it goes all the way back to the beginning of cities, people being able to make change right where they live in front of their doorstep and you know, improve their place incrementally and at a low cost and how that adds up over time. And I think now the tools and the materials and the resources we have you know, around the globe are just allows us to do this so much faster and so much more effectively. And that's, that's really exciting. And so re, you know, thinking about the lessons learned here and how we can apply them at a larger scale with city governments, you know, with regional governments, with nonprofits, with activists, is really where the, the movement has grown over the years. Number two, you can use you know, demonstration projects really quick, really cheap. You know, we're talking hundred, hundreds of dollars, not, not tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, where you can make changes and try it out for a few days while you're doing a plan. So you're using the project as a platform to, to talk to people and get feedback. You know, you can take tactical urbanism and use it after a planning process is done. So you don't lose all that momentum, all the public trust and the goodwill you might have built, 
built over a 12 or 18 month planning process, start implementing, you know, the next day you can do that too and take some of the big ideas and start to pilot them right away so that you can continue to um, move yourself on the path to long-term transformation. When you have the funding and the buy-in for large scale capital projects, we often recommend that, you know, communities will do some pilot or interim design projects first to best understand how the street can be transformed, how it's used, make street edits, make changes to that, learn from the project so that when you do reconstruct a street or a public space, it's learned from the short-term process with all those learnings and all that data that's been collected. So the lasting result is, um, is you know, the performance is better long-term. Um, maybe much more specifically, you can test individual materials. This is a, an example from Northwest Arkansas where we did a, a number of pilot projects to connect communities to their incredible trail system called the Razorback Greenway. And you know, this was the first time we were introducing uh, on-street bikeways that were meant to be protected, but low cost in their construction. And so we wanted to test multiple ways to do that from a barrier element perspective. So we were really looking at the performance and preference of people with those barrier types. I'm sure a lot of you know Charles Montgomery and his fantastic team at Happy City. We were able to work with them on a, a research project in West Palm Beach on the waterfront where we measured a group of people before and after an intervention that we led on the, you know, which you can see on the left to understand how people responded to that intervention um, in a number of different ways, uh, emotionally and from a trust building perspective and how calm they were, you know, before and after. So you can really use tactical urbanism as a way to do more academic, you know, inquiries and in, in research projects. Number seven, we've seen tactical urbanism applied after, you know, some of the worst crises we've seen around the globe. Um, pictured here is a couple images from after the uh, series of earthquakes that hit Christchurch, New Zealand about a, more than a decade ago. And then the incredible response from the people there on, um, on how to start rebuilding their city. And they didn't wait for you know, millions and millions of dollars from, from, their, from their government. They started reusing materials from the rubble and activating those, uh, those spaces to bring life and social activity back to their community. And it's that impulse to, to respond to crisis quickly that we saw during the pandemic. So a little aside here, you know, I love this image from Toronto. Um, this artist was out with his uh, six foot radius, um, um, uh, I don't know what, I'm sure what the name was of this installation, but you can see how he's showing that, okay, if we all need six feet, doing that in a compact city is very, very challenging. So we need street space. And street space is what was taken for those purposes around the globe. When we worked with um, NACTO and, and uh, GDCI, the Global Designing Cities Initiative, to, um, to provide guidance, we looked at all those initiatives globally. And really, it came down to these six different transformations that cities were um, experimenting with. Um, and by June of that year, in 2020, we saw initiatives from all over the globe, and multiple communities were doing multiple things um, on their streets to, to test them out. Um, so there's a lot of guidance that came out of that. Um, but I think, again, the most important thing is we could see whether it's the shortest and most small scale and, and, and inexpensive project that you see on the left to the pilot materials and processes to more interim design that's coming out of those projects um, to long-term investment. You can see there on the right from Paris, one of their pandemic bikeways. Uh, you know, I took that image in 2021 on a visit where there's being upgraded with permanent infrastructure. So to respond to crises, we can be really um, nimble when we need to be with the methodology. What we call site revitalization, that's when you might have you know, underutilized uh, space in the city, whether that's you know, a storefront or it's a street or it's a public space. And how do you bring life to that you know, quickly and do a lot of trialing of different programs and activations to, to build life and build longer term investment in around those, those vacant spaces? Number nine, road safety response. We, we suffer from terrible traffic crashes around um, you know, the United States and of course the globe. And when those crashes happen, you know, ideally you would have design your streets beforehand so they don't happen so severely, but you can respond very quickly as we did in Brooklyn, New York, um, you know, about a year and a half ago when a little baby who was three months old got run over by a uh, reckless driver. Um, and so we responded with the city and were able to close off this short street so that would not be possible ever again. And finally, to, to scale this work and to um, make the, the, the methodologies, the materials very clear and to include NGOs and citizens and, and many different actors. Cities have developed uh, policies and programs and guides on how to do that officially. And I think that's really an important thing to consider if we wanna take tactical ur urbanism, to, not from a 
project scale, but to a citywide scale. So I'm going to end with two quick case studies um, before we get to the questions and the dialogue um, with Gil. And one is from a project called Move Culver City, um, which we initiated in, in 2020, um, in 2021. And this was really meant to be uh, the transformation of three quarters in Culver City, which is a, um, it's a suburban um, uh, city just adjacent to Los Angeles, between Los Angeles and Santa Monica. Um, it's the home of the film industry. So there's, there's lots of, of jobs and studios and, and whatnot um, in that place. But in any event, there was some good plans that were developed around their, their metro station, around um, cycling and walking. Um, and then the pandemic hit and they had to make some of those changes more quickly and realize that we could maybe make some of those changes last longer and test more um, amenities and infrastructure uh, on these major streets. And so we worked with the city very closely in the community to bring in a whole range of project elements from protected bus lanes and bike lanes to um, a lot of pedestrian safety interventions to accommodating micromobility and then bring in placemaking as sort of the, the overlay to all of that to support their goals um, at the city and in some of their policies. You know, street plans worked with um, T.Y. Lin and Sam Schwartz on all the street design. Uh, we developed all the asphalt art and we went through several months of, of work and revisions alongside the community um, to then ultimately result in a, a week-long installation to deliver on the, the 1.3 miles uh, along the corridor, all those big transformations. You can see here the sheer amount of space that we were taking back. And in summary, it was in total 2.6 miles of dedicated bus lanes, 14 new uh, bus and bike platforms that we had uh, fabricated, um, more than a mile of protected bike lanes and uh, 30,000 square feet of asphalt art, which is I think the largest installation that we have done to date. Um, and some quick before and afters, you can see five lanes that go down to, to the two. And here's a big transformation as well at another location, um, the amount of space that we were, we were able to reclaim and give back to other modes. Um, and we, like any pilot project, we study it very closely to understand what's working. And of course, more importantly, what's not. But we also measure, you know, what is the, the pre and post in terms of the, the way the, sp the space is being used. In the post implementation at one location, you can see here, uh, actually, sorry, the summary of all the locations along the whole corridor was we went from 100% space for motor vehicles, parking and driving um, to 56% uh, of the space given over to uh, other ways of, of moving and being on the corridor. So walking, cycling and, and bus transport. Um, so really pretty dramatic transformation in, um, in that community. And we issued two different pilot reports, one at the six month mark, one at the year mark to, you know, to be able to report very transparently what we were learning and what the outcomes of this project were. We saw a large increase, you know, almost 40% in their city bus ridership, um, you know, more, in, even larger increase in cycling um, and micromobility trips. Uh, bus times it went much faster. So if you're moving through the corridor, that was then four minutes faster to go from end to end. Um, and we saw an increase in, in pedestrian activity, which was actually even greater in the core of the downtown area. It was a 36% increase um, from November to, you know, 2019 to um, October 2021. And you know the net impact of this to motor vehicle traffic was um, zero minutes delay in one direction and about two minutes delay to go through the whole quarter in the other, um, all the while seeing some post-COVID you know, um, increases as people start driving and doing that a bit more often of, of 10%. So you can get all of that as benefit for, um, for the, the, the impact of having you know, two plus minutes for people driving in one direction on the quarter. So yay, it's a huge success, right? Let's go and try to make this permanent. Let's improve it. Let's go on to the other corridors. No, that's not what happened. The politics changed pretty dramatically. New city council came in, um, a bit of leadership was lost and city council decided to roll back some of the better um, elements that were in this project, including um, combining the bus and bike lane so they could uh, reintroduce uh, travel lanes for, for traffic on the street. So even when we have all the data, even when we have success, even when we think we have a good amount of public support, um, sometimes these projects get you know, changed and they get um, adapted to go in different directions that you may not have predicted. But that is the reality of the political process. And so it's important to really understand what your strategies are, if and when that might happen with the projects that you bring to a community and then being very transparent about, you know, being able to make those changes 
and seeing what you learn for the next one and the next one and the next one. So case study number two, and I'll, I'll move relatively quickly here so we can have a conversation, um, is in, in Jersey City, which is just across the Hudson River um, from us in New York City. It's a small city of um, 14 square miles, but 307, uh, sorry, um, 275,000 people. It's actually the, the second densest city in, in America. Um, so we've worked there for years on applying tactical urbanism during and after planning processes to deliver on their long-term goals, which are ultimately to achieve zero traffic fatalities um, on, on their city streets. So it began in 2016 with a pedestrian plan and we used um, you know, uh, demonstration projects to engage the broader community to then inform some of the policy recommendations that are in, in that plan. Um, the city then took a whole bunch of the learnings and the recommendations and started doing these very quick uh, interim upgrades, testing out new geometries and trying to improve pedestrian safety, including the introduction of their first parklets. Uh, we worked on the bike master plan and design guide, which came next. Um, that was a citywide strategy in conjunction with the Vision Zero Action Plan to uh, deliver a, a whole new bike network of which um, much of it would be protected. Again, we used demonstration projects to test out uh, different types of infrastructure on city streets and to get public feedback. We saw that people use those streets in the way that they were intended, which was great. We also learned some things on how this particular corridor could be transformed in the midterm, which is exactly what happened within the same year. So this is the, the sort of the quick build version of that corridor um, that used the learnings from um, the test. And again, we collect all the data. We learned that there are more people cycling. Cars are actually traveling for the most part much faster through the corridor, going from four lanes down to three, um, which was a great outcome. And people were going slower. Um, and so after those few years and those two projects, the investment opportunity came to really invest citywide in uh, transforming streets and starting with some of the most dangerous ones at that, which is, this is a good example from Washington Boulevard where they were about to repave the project. So in the months leading up to it, put in a you know, protected bike lane really, really quickly and expensively, learned something, repaved the streets. We came in and we redesigned it, as you see here. That got implemented for a couple of years and then they came back again and have upgraded the materials to be much longer lasting. So that iterative process on just this one street is basically the methodology they're using citywide. And there you can see the more recent version of that with longer lasting green paint um, and the, um, the hardened barriers on the bike lane. In total, um, it's now actually 24 miles of protected bike lanes have been completed in four years time. That's over half of the planned network in the plan. And there are many new projects that are currently underway. Um, this process is not just obviously about cycling, but they've got some of these great public spaces that they've transformed with the same methodology. You can see over the years from 2014 to 2022, the transformation that's happened on the Newark Avenue pedestrian plaza. And then a street that connects to that, which we've been working on for years as well. Uh, this is Grove Street in 2013. They got bike lanes in 2014. Uh, in 2019, they got the city's very first protected bike lane while we were still working on the plan. Um, you can even see the, the markings there in the middle of the street, how they made those changes. And then during the pandemic, um, to help outdoor dining, to have more space for, for the public outdoors, it got transformed again into a one lane street. Uh, and I'll show you an image of what that plan is going to look like to make this permanent as well. So the pandemic response, you know, they were very nimble and very effective at this because they had built this muscle internal to the city. And we were able to work very quickly with the community in crisis to respond to that pandemic. And of course, we all learned the value of public space and open space in our communities um, over those few years. And as part of their comprehensive plan update, uh, they learned that there was you know, much more need to think about the programmatic elements of public space and from an equity perspective, how to deliver more public space in communities that needed it the most. And so we worked with them on a campaign called the Year of Open Space, where we looked to streets primarily to create new public spaces and test out ways to work with community groups to steward and improve those spaces over time, and then take those learnings and feed them into a um, whole new policy and process uh, that could support communities in the delivery of those spaces longer term. Um, on down to our latest demonstration projects, this is one we didn't get to during the Year of Open Space campaign, but this is a school called PS5. Uh, we worked with students to develop um, asphalt art designs that went, went out and tested it for a couple of weeks. Um, this fall, that project is actually going to be made more permanent. And this is going to help the public space and the circulation in front of that school. 
So in total, all the projects that we've worked on with the city, um, they've done much more than this, but this is the ones that we've worked on with the city are, are mapped here. We just created those maps a couple of days ago. Um, all of that work, right, it adds up. This is, this is transformative change that's been done at the low cost and incremental scale for about seven years now. And you know, very happily in 2022, we learned that the city had zero fatalities on their city streets, which is four years in advance of their goal. Um, that's not to say that they didn't have fatalities overall. There were state and county roads, which also had some fatalities, had, had five total, but that was a pretty dramatic reduction from the 14 that they had the year before. So this is just a series of charts where you can see the background of yellow. That's when the vision zero policy kicked into place. And then you can see last year where there were zero fatalities. Um, so that's really this lesson that as a city that has very little staff working on these issues, that doesn't have huge amounts of resources, um, this can add up to really transformative change. And it's, I think, one of my favorite examples of, of where we've been able to scale up the methodology to very positive impact. So the next couple of projects are, are, you know, we've been focusing on public spaces like that Grove Street, you know, transformation and how to make that permanent. So our team has been doing the long-term designs for um, the city. So why do we do this? Because the brain tends to remember 10% of what it reads, you know, 20% of what it hears. So you take away one out of five things that I share with you today, that, that's great. But 90% of what we do or what we simulate, and that's what tactical urbanism is all about. It's the doing that matters and delivering change. Um, so we have resources. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gil for dialogue and questions. Thank you. Mike, I want to ask you for if you could have a call to action. We have people from all over the world in multiple areas. They want to do things. Uh, some people even want to do the activism of put on uh, an, an orange vest and go and paint the crosswalk because mm -hmm. the government doesn't want to do it. And some people say, well, you just get three people with orange vest and the police thinks that they are the city. Mm -hmm. But but honestly, how, how a call to action, how can people use tactical urbanism, get people out pumped to go? Well, I, I, and I want to thank it... you very much. And let's end with this call to action to people are, sure. from everywhere. Sure, thank you, Gil. I, I think it, it's it's the power of doing that that is you know effective you know in, in changing the conversation. People don't respond well or pay attention to meetings and renderings like those those have a place and a role, but it's doing that matters. And so getting out there and doing in your community and yes, if that's unsanctioned to begin with, um, that's one way to go about it. If you can you know get your community and, and city leaders to you know, work on and invest in this approach and process, all the better because that's what you're going to need ultimately for the scalability. Um, and then within that realm, I would say one last piece of advice is start small, start really, really small, start with the crosswalk, start with the street corner, start with the one parking space, develop and learn from those scale of investments and changes, and then start to move it forward. If you start with a mile or a kilometer, that's going to be much more complicated and challenging from the beginning and oftentimes more difficult for the city to accept. So start really small and grow it from there. What a wonderful recommendation. Don't start with the most difficult, the most expensive, the most risky project, because if that fails, everything fails and they won't listen to you for the next 10 years. So like Mike says, try to start with smaller projects, highly likely to be successful because that will give you credibility and the oxygen to move to bigger projects and bigger things and make it citywide. Mike, thank you very, very much. And I want everybody to remember, get this recording and send it to all decision makers and advocates. And th thanks a lot. Much appreciated your, your presence, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Bye. Mike, thank you very, very much. What a fascinating presentation on tactical urbanism. You showed us how to do it, why it works in cities of 2,000 people or half a million or five or 10 million wealthy or poor, and how it can work in projects that are one street corner or a small block or many miles. And it can work on, on public space, it can work on sidewalks, on streets, and how to engage the community, how to get people involved, how it works even better when you have the elected officials getting a brush and actually painting along with the children and the families and the people in the area. I think there's a lots of examples. It's very, very useful. I hope that people that see this video will share it with decision makers, elected officials, city staff, media advocates. 
because there are very many, many lessons for everybody. It, this really meets the idea of why we created this webinar, to get citizens to move also from talking to doing. This is not a time to be silent. And I hope that this will help you become even more passionate advocate. Thank you. And we'll see you in two weeks.